Welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering ghost tours and paranormal adventures in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario, and online experiences to anyone in this mortal realm. My name is Jim Dean. I am the creative director, and we thank you for joining us for this episode. It was a tense moment in the Canadian House of Commons. A free vote on a controversial bill was being held, and the tally calculated. The yeas and nays were close, nearly deadlocked, as the record was checked for accuracy. The life and death of several people hung in the balance as the Canadian nation watched on. Finally, after a few more nervous minutes, the calculations were complete. The bill had narrowly passed. The tally was 130 to 124. The date was July 14th, 1976, and the death penalty was finally abolished in Canada. This rare free vote in the House had caused quite a stir. There were accusations of political maneuvering on both sides of the issue And the intense debate, which lasted over two months, revealed plenty of divides in the Canadian political landscape. Although while public opinion was shifting, it was still evident that the majority of Canadians favoured the retention of the death penalty for the worst crimes on record. This vote went against the public will. Even after its abolition, people would regularly call for its reinstatement. But regardless of individual opinions, the status of the death penalty had changed a lot leading up to the big vote. In particular, botched hangings with very gruesome endings had changed people's minds about the humanity of the practice. By the time it was abolished in 1976, there hadn't been a hanging in Canada in well over a decade. A moratorium had been imposed in 1967. Nonetheless, there were 11 men on death row in 1976, and all were spared the hangman's noose when the bill passed that summer. Notably, there were no women on death row when the practice was officially ended. In fact, there had been so few women executed throughout Canada's history that there was no official death row for women, and they were treated on a case-by-case basis. Let's take a quick look at those numbers to understand the small scale we're talking about. And just a note, due to incomplete or confusing historical records, the precise numbers appear slightly different depending on the source. We'll use the dates from 1867, the year of Canada's confederation and separation from the British penal colony, and 1976, the day of abolition. In the 109 years, that the death penalty was on the books, an estimated total of 1,533 death sentences were passed down. Of those 702, only 11 were known to be women. That works out to about 1.5%. In this episode, we will be examining and exploring some of the specific cases of women who were executed in Canada delve a little bit into their backstories and the circumstances that surrounded these very rare events. But before we get to that, for those of you who have been following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, you already know we have launched that major new product I have been mentioning in previous episodes. Alone in the Dark, at the Elgin and Winter Garden Theatre is running now. We're very excited about this experience and it's unlike anything we've done before. Now the Elgin and Winter Garden, as the name suggests, is a double-decker theatre, so it contains two theatres stacked on top of each other. Now they both have really interesting histories and quite a few ghost stories about them as well. In particular, I like that the Winter Garden, which is the upper theatre, 
which is designed to look like a blooming garden, was closed down, boarded up, and virtually abandoned for 60 years, just waiting there in the dark for something to happen. On Alone in the Dark, we get to explore the building when it's completely empty, including the theaters. We share the ghost stories, but also we discuss some of humanity's attempts to connect with the other side and give you a chance to try some of these techniques in the haunted theaters. Now, right now, we're only offering this experience on select days, Mondays and Thursdays in August, September, and select dates in October. These are very small groups, 12 people at a time. And if you're anywhere around the GTA and you love ghost stories and paranormal investigation, this is an experience you don't want to miss. I'd advise getting your tickets as quickly as possible as we are starting to sell out already. As we're talking about timing, another thing to mention is that our ghost tours at Upper Canada Village in Morrisburg, Ontario, Eastern Ontario, roughly between Ottawa and Kingston, will be ending as of the Labor Day weekend for the season. So if you're thinking of joining us at the village, don't miss your opportunity to see us there as well. Information on all our ghost tours and paranormal adventures in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto can be found on our website, which is hauntedwalk.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, all at Haunted Walk, so you get the latest news and new products that we're offering. Finally, we would love your help to get the word out about the show, and two easy ways you can do that is to leave us a five-star review wherever you listen, and of course, to recommend Haunted Talks to friends, family members, acquaintances, anyone you know that loves the paranormal. First, let's consider why so few women were hanged. One of the main reasons is that women committed fewer death penalty crimes than men. The most popular death penalty crime was murder, and women just weren't engaged in as many murders as men. Those who were often convicted had male accomplices that were painted as the mastermind behind the crime, and the women were sometimes spared a death sentence if they presented themselves as vulnerable to male manipulation. Others, as we'll see, weren't so lucky. Other times, women were able to escape the noose by pleading insanity, or common in the late 19th century, hysteria. Because of gendered stereotypes, women were seen as too weak and submissive to commit violent acts like murder. If they did murder someone, it could easily be argued, using the gender norms of the day, that they were acting out of character and must be unstable. Even if they did commit murder, some women were spared the death sentence because the execution of women was generally seen as abhorrent by larger society. Not wanting to risk the wrath of the public, some judges and lawyers steered away from the death penalty, even for crimes that could carry an execution. Even today, in places where death sentences are still carried out, executions of women are much rarer than those for men who commit the same crimes. But there are always exceptions, and in Canada, there were at least 11 women who were executed between 1867 and 1976. Of those, six were convicted for murdering their husbands, two for murdering a police officer, one for murdering their domestic employer, one for murdering someone during a robbery, and one for assisting in a bombing. For the rest of this episode, we're going to explore these cases, some in greater detail than others. Although fewer women were executed in Canada's history, their cases and horrific ends tend to turn public opinion in dramatic ways, often resulting in greater cause for the abolition of the death penalty. Let's start by looking at a few of the cases that drew sensational headlines, beginning with Florence Lissandro. It was the early 1920s, 
in many Western provinces were in the era of prohibition, where the manufacture and sale of alcohol was illegal. But in the many edges of the frontier, especially in the secluded towns of the Rocky Mountains, enterprising businesses found a way to make and distribute illegal alcohol. One such business was run out of a hotel in Blairmore, Alberta, owned by Emilio Picarelio. His employees, the Lissandro family, assisted with the successful operation, but the authorities were on to them, and Picarello's son had recently gotten into an altercation with a constable. Falsely believing that his son was dead, Emilio went to confront the constable with his business partner, Florence Lissandro. The exact events of what happened are unknown, but the constable was shot dead, and both Emilio and Florence were arrested for being present. Although it was never determined who administered the fatal shot, both were tried for murder and received the death penalty upon conviction. Appeals for clemency were denied, and both were executed in May 1923. However, public opinion was very divided, with many believing that the sentences were too harsh. Florence's gender may have played a role, as she was fashioned as an innocent woman who was swept up in a man's world. She was only 22 at the time of the murder, and was painted as a devout woman guided by her faith. Even those who believed in Emilio's guilt were softer on Florence, and her pleas of innocence pushed some to advocate against the death penalty. In all, the case's biggest legacy was the abolishment of prohibition, as historians point to the very public case of Florence Lissandro as helping turn the tide. Out of all the women executed for a single murder, only one was accused of killing another woman, Emily Hilda Blake, because her victim, Mary Lane, was also a woman who was pregnant at the time of her murder. Hilda wasn't treated with as much sympathy in the eyes of the public. Her position as a domestic servant also didn't help her standing. Instead, many people were simply perplexed by the case. It was rather simple. Hilda decided to purchase a gun and one day used it to kill her employer, Mary Lane, while hanging curtains. Hilda didn't try to hide her crime and confessed almost immediately. She waived the right to a lawyer in a trial and instead requested a harsh penalty. Others were concerned about Hilda, though. There were outside calls for clemency due to her mental state. Although Hilda did try to escape prison, she seemed to accept her fate and gave no satisfactory explanation for why she had stepped so far outside of gender and social class expectations of the time. Her hanging didn't inspire abolitionists in the same way others did, but many questioned why a woman carried out such violence. Hilda never answered those questions. Another woman was sentenced to death for killing her employer, Elizabeth Popovich. Her employer, Louis Natto, was killed by Elizabeth and her husband George as Louis sat in his car. The murderers had escaped with a small amount of cash but were quickly tracked down. The middle-aged couple were tried together and executed less than an hour apart. Much like Florence, Elizabeth was initially painted as a naive woman who had simply followed her husband's compulsion for robbery. But there was evidence of premeditation and Elizabeth was also labeled a seductress. At the trial, it was argued that Elizabeth had actually used her sexuality to lure Louis Natto, and it was during a steamy rendezvous in his car that he was robbed and murdered. Once this information was presented, few were willing to defend Elizabeth's womanly character. Although there were a few other sensational headlines of women participating in crimes, usually reserved for men, most of the women executed in Canada were accused of murdering their spouse. At least six women were executed for killing their husbands. Even more women were convicted of this offense 
but successfully pleaded insanity or had their sentences commuted. While there was some public sympathy for women who killed their husbands, this was also seen as an inexcusable crime by society. Remember, this is a period where women were expected to be submissive to their husbands, and any issues within the marriage were somehow due to the wife's failure. With divorce extremely difficult, if not impossible, to obtain, women were often stuck in marriages that didn't work, or worse still, were abusive. Reading between the lines of newspaper reports from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we can see that some women who killed their husbands were being abused and had no other way out of their marriages. For these women accused of murder, pleading with the courts about what they had suffered at the hands of their abusive husbands was almost of no use. What we know now as battered wife syndrome was not a credible defense. While some lawyers tried to demonstrate the connections between ongoing domestic abuse and women committing murder, it rarely worked. With the limited information available, it's difficult to paint an accurate picture of the women in Canada who were executed for murdering their husbands. But let's take a look at a couple. One of the most notable cases of misjustice is that of Elizabeth Workman. Her crime was well documented, and she admitted to brutally beating her husband James to death. However, it was also established that James was extremely abusive, inflicting physical, emotional, and financial abuse on his wife that was fueled by alcohol. Elizabeth's character was defended by nearly everyone who knew the couple, while people readily admitted that James was overly dominant of his wife. It is unclear what led to the final beating in October 1872. Elizabeth Workman took a mop handle to her husband, and he died a few days later. The judge in the case tried everything he could to sway public opinion, which was rather sympathetic to Elizabeth. The judge accused her of being an adulterer, and stated that her possible accomplice, Samuel Butler, should be let off the hook because she was an evil seductress who led him to commit the crime. There was absolutely zero evidence of an affair, and even the public wasn't buying the narrative. In fact, Butler seemed like one of the only people trying to intervene against James's violence. Despite all the evidence of her good character and the horrific years of abuse she endured, and public opinion firmly with her, the jury was forced to find Elizabeth guilty of murder. They pleaded for leniency given the circumstances of James's death, but it all fell on deaf ears. The judge, the only one responsible for delivering the sentence, didn't hesitate in passing down the death penalty. Many have pointed out the serious holes in the case and have noted that convicting Elizabeth today would be nearly impossible. There was too much circumstantial evidence. It was clear she was abused at the hands of her husband, and she wasn't even defended in court as she couldn't afford a lawyer. None of that mattered in 1873, however, and Elizabeth was sent to the gallows. There have since been calls for her conviction to be overturned as a clear case of battered wife syndrome and a miscarriage of justice. On the legal side, her case is one of the only executions that went against the will of a jury in Canada. While many members of the public were outraged, the event didn't turn the tide of opinion on capital punishment, nor on domestic abuse. For women who murdered their husbands for their own financial or personal gain, public opinion was clearly against them. That didn't stop the public, though, from soaking up sensational stories and intriguing headlines, such as the case of Cordelia Vio, which is still a major subject of interest in Quebec to this day. Cordelia Vio was sentenced to death alongside her supposed lover for the murder of her husband. 
The man was brutally stabbed in bed and his throat dramatically slashed. After a lengthy interrogation, the boyfriend apparently confessed to be part of the crime but pointed the finger primarily at Cordelia. He claimed that they were lovers and she used her seducing ways to convince him to commit murder. Cordelia's side of the story is much less clear and largely undocumented. There is a supposed confession she made in a letter, but there are also claims that Cordelia was innocent. French language films and books produced on the case argue there is much more here than meets the eye. Whether or not Cordelia was actually innocent of the crime, it was clear that public opinion was firmly against her at the time. Characterized as seductress during a time when women's sexuality was considered evil, the defense of Cordelia was minimal. The confession of her boyfriend had done its damage, and despite pleas of innocence and mercy, Cordelia's reputation was destroyed. The case gathered so much interest, fueled by inflammatory international media headlines, that nearly 2,000 people showed up at the Montreal facility where the two were executed. Although public hangings were illegal, it didn't stop people from storming the prison in an attempt to get a glimpse of the morbid yet romanticized pair of murderers. People's fascination with watching an execution didn't end with the abolition of public hangings. In fact, you could still attend executions in Canada if you had an invitation until 1935. It was a cold day in March of that year when a woman's execution changed that practice. At 71 years old, Arthur Ellis had been Canada's primary hangman for 23 years. He would travel the country carrying out death sentences and trying to ensure they were done humanely by carefully calculating the length of the rope needed based on someone's weight. In March 1935, he was called to execute Thomasina Sarau. She, along with two male accomplices, had been convicted of murdering her husband to collect the insurance money. All three murderers were to be executed on the same day in the same place. By all accounts, the first two went off as expected, and both men were quickly pronounced dead. However, Thomasina's execution was about to go down as one of the most famous in Canadian history. Arthur Ellis later claimed he was given the wrong weight for Thomasina, and as a result, he had added about a foot too much of rope. The result was a longer and heavier fall that caused Thomasina to be decapitated. The brutal botched execution was witnessed by a few invited guests who watched in horror. The decapitation of Thomasina had three major impacts on capital punishment in Canada. First, Arthur Ellis retired after over 20 years as Canada's executioner, unable to continue serving in his post. He died three years later, reportedly still haunted by the horrific event. Second, invited guests were no longer permitted to witness executions. They were officially closed doors affairs from here on. Finally, public opinion had started to shift. The reports of a middle-aged mother being decapitated by the state was more than many Canadians could bear. The fact that Thomasina was a woman certainly helped the cause of abolitionists who began arguing hard for the end of the death penalty. Even when hangings were debated in the House of Commons 40 years later, the morbid fate of Thomasina was mentioned. It was a major turning point in Canada's history of executions. However, there were other cases of women murderers that became famous for unknown reasons. Perhaps the public simply enjoyed speculating on the topic. Given the gendered stereotypes of the time, it's often difficult to determine the precise motives of women who murdered their husband and were sentenced to death. For example, there's the case of Phoebe Campbell, 
who was famously hanged in 1870 for the murder of her husband George. Despite never holding the murder weapon, her passivity while he was brutally stabbed beside her was a key reason for her conviction. A changing confession, where she pointed fingers at three different men in her life for assisting with the crime, didn't help her with her pleas of innocence. Surprisingly, she was the only one actually sentenced for George's murder, even though it was clear she did not do the deed herself. The last woman to receive the death penalty in Canada has one of the most intriguing stories, and that's where we will end our episode today. This is the story of Marguerite Petra, another woman who was the recipient of so much public fascination because she had seemingly stepped outside gender norms to assist in one of the deadliest mass murders in Canadian history. However, like so many others in our episode today, there are plenty of lingering questions about her level of involvement and motives, leading to speculation that a miscarriage of justice may have played out. Two simple things to know about Marguerite Petra, both of which sealed her fate. One, she owned a rooming house where a young woman, Mary Ang Robitaille, had come to stay. And two, she had a brother, Genaru, who could assemble bombs. The common denominator in these two seemingly random facts was a married man named Albert Gay. You see, Albert Gay had been carrying on an affair with Mary Ong Robitaille since she was 17 years old. When her parents found out about the romance, they were furious and kicked Mary Ong out of the house. Although he couldn't stay with her due to his marriage, Albert arranged for Mary Ong to find lodging at a rooming house owned by the sister of his watch repairman. She stayed there for a while as Albert paid her rent till things cooled off with her parents and she was able to move back in. But Albert had made up his mind. He wanted to be with Mary Ong, and since divorce was not an option, he would have to get rid of his wife. After pondering a few options, Albert decided to kill his wife in an elaborate bomb plot. He was going to bomb a commercial airplane. He enlisted the help of Jeanne Roux, that watch repairman who had helped find housing for Marianne. At some point, the two men decided to bring Jeanne Roux's sister, Marguerite, the one who owned the rooming house, into the plan. Albert would claim that Marguerite knew from the beginning what they had planned to do and agreed to help them in order to pay off a debt. During the ensuing trial, Marguerite agreed she had assisted Albert and Genereau to wipe a 600 debt off the books, but claimed she knew nothing of the bomb and unwillingly participated in the plot to kill Albert's wife. Regardless of her prior knowledge, Marguerite did participate. First, she bought dynamite for the bomb, putting the purchase in her name and then supplied it to her brother. Then, on the day of the crime, she ran into a Quebec City airport with a package in her hand and breathlessly asked that it be placed on Flight 108, scheduled to depart in a matter of minutes. The package made it on board, but the plane's takeoff was slightly delayed. When the harrowing explosion occurred a bit earlier in the flight path than intended, the airplane didn't go down into the river as planned, and most of the forensic evidence was preserved, later assisting in securing a conviction. Still, the bomb had hit its target and killed all 23 people on board, including Albert's wife. Marguerite cooperated with authorities and told them everything she knew. Her testimony and the preserved forensics of the crime scene ensued that Albert and Jeanne Roux received a death sentence. But she also figuratively signed her own death warrant, since she knew so much about the plot, she was assumed to be as guilty as the others. The case against Marguerite was thin, and she maintained her story throughout all three trials. 
but it was to no avail. The overly emotional and loud Marguerite, who was called out as odd by her neighbors for her peculiar manners and dress, wouldn't escape her fate. She was hanged on January 6, 1953, and was the final woman executed in Canada for her part in the first bomb attack on a commercial flight in North American history. It would be nine more years until the final two men were executed in Canada, a double hanging at Toronto's Don Jail. The death penalty was coming under more scrutiny and high profile cases involving women, including Marguerite Pitre and Thomasina Saro, inspired more vocal opposition to the practice. It would take another 14 years to be officially taken off the books and the threat of the death penalty continued to loom for Canadian courts. Looking back, we can see some of the miscarriages of justice that were carried out, such as the conviction of Elizabeth Workman. We can also see all the sensational headlines that captivated the Canadian public, such as the questionable romantic motives of Cordelia Vio or the prohibition bootlegger Florence Lissandro. But in the end, all of the women executed by the Canadian justice system were ordinary people with individual stories. Some tragic, some adventurous, some questionable. As we reflect on the legacy of the death penalty in Canada, it's important to remember the individual stories and circumstances that led to these women being hanged. Thank you so much for joining us for the episode. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about Arthur Ellis, Canada's official executioner for so many years, we did write a blog post about that a few years ago, and I will put a link for that in the show notes. If you are interested in exploring the topic of capital punishment in Canada a little bit more, I would highly recommend our haunted Ottawa jail tour get to learn a little bit about how the executions were carried out administratively, and you also get to see the gallows where the executions took place. And we have quite a few great ghost stories about that building. For you folks in or around the GTA, I do want to remind you about Alone in the Dark at the Elgin and Winter Garden Theatre. That is an experience you don't want to miss. It's really unique, very exclusive, and we're already getting some very interesting results from our early groups that have gone through, seeing some patterns already that we're really curious if they will continue to develop. If you're in or around Kingston, Ottawa, or Toronto, we would certainly invite you to come out and join us on a ghost tour this month. The summer always seems to get away from us so quickly, so don't miss out on a fun night out. And we also have many of our tours which are dog-friendly including our original haunted walks in all three cities. So if you want to bring the whole family out, we do have paranormal adventures for you. Tickets and information for all of our various ghost tours and paranormal adventures can be found on our website, which is hauntedwalk.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, all at Haunted Walk, to get the latest news and updates. And if you have a moment to leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to us. It would be a great way to help support the show and let us know that you're out there and listening. As always, a special thanks to our Haunted Talks team, including Brittany Buss, who researched and wrote this episode, and Michelle Dennis, our outstanding audio editor. Until we meet again, sweet dreams.